Let me say, first of all, I wanted to just really, once again, you know, uh, you guys knocked it out of the park. I think all us preachers can say that. And uh, just with your courtesy, with how this thing was super organized, and uh, I know it's a lot of work on your congregation. So uh, I, don't, I don't take none of that lightly. So appreciate you guys. Um, hopefully my church is, is watching. We were not able to meet back home, so I, I gave them the link, and I want to just thank them for allowing me the opportunity. Um, I, I pastor a church, and uh, we've been, every time I get back here, dude, there's a lot of power back here, guys, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to say, well, I got a lot to say, I got to hurry up, but, <laughs> but um, okay, the kindness, the, my gratitude, thank God, um, all the preaching has been like, totally amazing Amen. and I was I, I unfortunately I missed the first night and I feel like I'm really short because I can barely see over this <laughs> mic but um uh it's actually anyway I am sure it's okay I'll I'll run around a little um but uh oh so I missed the first night we didn't mean to but when I came the second night oh my goodness man the singing my, hi- my hide was hanging up there like after 30 minutes. I was just like, should I just crawl under the pew now? Or, you know, um, so I, I, I need this, me. So I'm guessing if I do, maybe someone else in here does, or maybe, maybe those folks as well. And um, uh, I was thinking this morning, uh, these type of meetings have probably kept my marriage together, to tell you the truth. So, because my wife needs her Asian time, you know? (laughs) Amen. It it is hard being married to a white man. I'll just leave it at that, all right? (laughs) Hey, you know, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. I think my message just changed, though. No, I'm just... (laughs) All right. um, Let's go ahead and open our Bibles, because you guys didn't hear, come here to hear me. Amen. We came here to hear about the Word of God. Let's open up to uh, Numbers 16, and as you're opening there, it goes without saying that the last two years our country has changed. And uh, in effect, the churches um, have had to change right along with everything else. Um, some for better and some for worse. And what, what I've noticed is a lot of people have been exposed for what they really are. That's what I've noticed. And uh, people that wanted to stay in church, you know where they are today? They're in church. And people that, people that wanted to leave, you know where they are? They're at home. And um, uh, let's pray and then, uh, yeah, let's just pray. God, thank you so much for your mercy and grace. Thank you, God, for the, these meetings. Thank you for these preachers all the time they've spent on these messages. And God, now I, I just ask that I won't get in the way of what you're trying to do and that you would feed your sheep, Lord, and uh, that you would uh, bless this study that I've put together. And I pray that it would encourage your folks um, and all this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so with that being said, I want to just point out Lot's tents were turned towards Sodom long before he ever moved in. Amen? Uh, Lot's wife had her heart in Sodom long before she ever looked back. Uh, the prodigal son asked for his inheritance long before he ever landed in a faraway country. And... King Saul had retreated long before he offered David his armor to fight Goliath. And uh, when that brother was preaching that, it's all like one big message to me, so I apologize if it was your message and I can't remember who preached it, but it was just one big kick in the teeth for me. But um, I was thinking about this, you know, would Saul have taken the credit if David beat Goliath with his armor on? That's what I was starting to think about. You know, maybe there was more there than we were actually thinking. 
You know, uh, maybe it wasn't about protecting David at all. Maybe it was like, hey, if this kid's got the guts, he could probably do it, and maybe I can get the credit for it. But uh, um, I recently listened to a podcast in regards to something called cowardice and how in the military it's a crime. Cowardice. I've never been in the military. I've got a lot of family that's been in the military, but um, I'll move on. <laughs> so, and even, even in the battlefield, if someone decides to run away in the middle of the battle, the command is to kill them and because they can reveal the safe haven uh, to the enemy. So um, at, they were also talking about, at, toward the end of this podcast, they, they were talking about cowardice, and they said there's a large amount of fear among military men of being branded a coward. And uh, just throughout history, I guess you look at a lot of the journals of these soldiers, and they'd write home and, and just say, you know, I don't want to be a coward. Yeah. You could think about... Uh, Uriah, you know, sleeping at David's doorstep. He wasn't going to go home. But, uh, but what they also brought up was men today have lost that fear of being thought a coward. They don't have it anymore. Um, so there used to be an extreme fear of cowardice and also the fear of God in this country. Uh, that's been lost in the cesspool of convenience, identity, and ultimately self-preservation. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Now, um, I just want to say this. If you ever believed anything about God and the Bible and the King James Bible and what Jesus did for you and the blood and, I mean, on and on and on. I mean, we could start the list, right? It just doesn't end what God has done for you. Now is not the time to quit. Now is not the time to turn your back. Amen. And um, the, the world, the flesh, and the devil wish to render you null and void. Uh, so with that, <laughs> I'm trying to bring you a message kind of in this vein here. And um, this probably involves preachers as well. But um, I believe that there are folks in this room that are probably preparing to quit on God. And it's already been touched. And uh, so while your tents are pointed towards Sodom, the lush green grass of Sodom, your heart is longing for Sodom that you came out of. Maybe, maybe you've already been delivered out, but now you're looking back. Uh, you're longing maybe for that faraway country away from God and the Bible. You're retreating one of the biggest fights of your life, and maybe you're even begging anybody to take your armor, or assuming that anybody could take your armor. Um, and the Bible tells us why. So uh, this is my title, and I don't know if it's fitting. I'm not good with titles, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to call it this. Before you leave church, this is why. This is why you're leaving. Before you leave church, this is why. Um, let's look at, uh, we're in number 16. And uh, I got to give you some kind of context here. In our text, we see a church in the wilderness getting ready for a church split. That's what we see. And we, we see people getting sick of their pastor and how things were run. And they think they're just as qualified as their pastor. They think that God will lead them through the Red Sea without this annoying pastor. Can I get an amen right there? <laughs> You're afraid to amen that, I know, but... <laughs> Um, and, and for those uh, snobs out there that, oh, this is an Old Testament text, this is not a Pauline epistle, Acts 7.38 says, this is he that was in the church in the wilderness, okay? So put that in your pipe and smoke it, okay? Read your Bible, all right? But throughout the years, I've seen people coming and going, and I'm sure you've seen them too, coming and going from churches, and there's one thing that they all have in common, it's reasons. They all got reasons. They got reasons, sure. Some reasons you can understand. Some reasons are even rational. But you know what I don't see a lot of? I don't see a lot of biblical reasons. That's what I don't see. Now, I don't know about where you guys live, where you're at. I mean, I guess probably in comparison to some folks, I'm kind of a new Baptist, actually. I wasn't raised Baptist. 
Um, I was raised in Calvary Chapel. That's where I got saved. Um, I attribute most of my problems to that, but, you know. <laughs> and you got to have some fun, man. You know what I'm saying? But, but um, in my town, which I grew up in, I minister in the town I did all my sinning in. So when I go out to street preach, I see all these people. Yeah, we know who you are. And they do. They do. They, well, they know who I was. Amen. Amen. And what's a, what's, a, what's a blessing is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, just as we're going through life, you know, I, my wife's always at my side. Amen. But she'll meet some of my old road dogs and she'll hear them talking and she's like, Randy, I couldn't picture you like that at all. And I'm just like, that's a miracle. Amen. Amen. But... But um, I want to show you here in the first three verses, there's some renowned reasons. It says, uh, we're in Numbers 16, verse 1. Now Korah, the son of Izar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Datham, and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation. Notice this phrase, men of renown. Verse 3, And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord." So the first thing I want to point out is kind of a far stretch that maybe Pastor Jane can elaborate on his next YouTube video that hits a million viewers. Um, I want to point out a satanic influence. Hold your finger there. Go to Genesis 6, verse 4. And um, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to wait too long because I probably have notes that are too long, okay? So I'm going to kind of just move along. And if you're taking notes, maybe it's better to write it. Genesis 6.4, it says, There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And any halfway understanding Bible preacher know that that's the sons of Seth. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> the godly line. If it's the godly line, why did he have to drown them all? You, know? and you see what I'm saying? But this is actually the only mention of the phrase men of renown. And you see it here the second time. These are the only two times in your Bible you see men of renown. So all I'm saying is there could have been more going on in number 16 than you think. And um, so I want to point out this. So that's your little nugget. You know, I forget what brother it was. He's like, oh man, I bet there's nuggets in that Bible. And I said, chicken nuggets, you know? <laughs> but um, that was your doctrinal application. But let's go to practical. In Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, it says, these six things doth the Lord hate. Could anybody agree if God hates it, it's probably satanic? Okay, okay. All right, roll, roll with me. We run down. There's a whole list there. You're familiar with it. But verse 19 says, A false witness is speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Right? Is that satanic? That is satanic. If you agreed with the first one, you got to say that's satanic. Right there. All right? So let me give you three more verses on this. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Well, Randy, we're not them that believe not. But what does this God of this world do? He blinds people, right? right. All right? Write down these two verses. 1 John 2, 9 and 1 John 2, 11. 1 John 2, 9 says, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness. What's he playing with? Something satanic. 1 John 2... 211. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. What did it call him? He's a brother. Isn't he? What's he playing with? Something satanic. And he's making it to church every week, multiple times a week. And what's he doing? He's a satanic Christian. That's what he is. Amen. I mean, sometimes they're behind pulpits. Why would, 
This thing doesn't have to be up here. This thing could be down there. He just puts it up here. It's a little easier to see. You see what I'm saying? Amen. You meet a few more of them and you might realize preachers might have this thing. Amen. Yeah, I don't know if he knows something about that, but I know something about that. All right. Um, so there, everybody's got their reasons. And uh, sometimes they're satanic. They're satanic influences. But in Numbers 16 and verse 3, that's going to be our core text, so hang out there. Uh, there's resentful reasons. And it says, They gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said unto them, Ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And the Lord is among them. Wherefore then, lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now I want to point out here, they're resenting through underestimation. In verse 3 it says, they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. In Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, uh, well, yeah, like uh, 11 through 12, but in verse 12, God is telling Moses something. And he says, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. So they gathered against Moses and Aaron, but who did they really gather against? Against God. These are God's people. Don't, don't forget the, the little personal application there. We're talking about some type of satanic Christians, you know? Who would have thought, right? Stick around, you you know? Yeah, just give it a chance, you know? Just open your heart, you know? (laughs) So (laughs) they thought they were going against Moses, but they were really going against God himself, you know? (laughs) They're they're putting it in the comments section, maybe, you know? You know, (laughs) and they they post, you know? I don't do that stuff, you know? Like, uh, I think I've done... You know why I don't do that? Because I get in enough trouble where I'm at, I don't need more, you know? Uh, I, I don't know when to shut up. <laughs> I, I didn't even look at the clock. Did we start at what time? 15? Okay, he's not, he's not going to tell me. You guys are, uh, all right. But they're also resenting through over-exaggeration in verse 3. It says, you take too much upon you. Really? Too much? Isn't he just doing what God asked him to do? You know, that sounds familiar. In Exodus 18, uh, Jethro shows up, and it says in verse 17, And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and the people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Why does everyone keep saying this? You know, it's like these guys in Numbers, they remember these old arguments. Why? Because they've been, they've been around. You know, and a, a young man in the ministry, um, you're going to have problems. Yeah. Why? Because you're young. Amen. No one cares what you have to say. That's true. You can grow a big, gray, ugly beard, yeah. and they still, yeah. man, <laughs> uh, unless you're 55, I ain't going to listen to you. And then, then you get 55, unless you're 105, I ain't, it, it, and it's just like, And, and, and the, thought, the thought is real, man, that, you know, in most churches, and I hope none of them are present, in most churches, if John the Baptist walked in, he would not be asked to pray. And in most churches, if Jesus Christ himself walked in, he wouldn't be allowed to preach. And I mean, I'm just saying, when you get to that point, like, you really got to kind of press pause there and think, what is really going on? Has culture really become that big in this church movement? You know what I'm saying? I say you know what I'm saying a lot, but I'm hoping you know what I'm saying. Okay, that's a, it's a crutch, you know? You know? Was it Toastmasters? You know, they always point that one out. But uh, the third thing they're resenting through is over-familiarity in verse 3. It says, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them. Uh, Moses, we know a little bit about you, buddy. You're a sinner. You know, uh, we've been in your ministry a little while, and we've been kind of watching you, and uh, we haven't forgot. We haven't forgot, Nexus, too. Uh, you killed a man. You know, and I've never killed a man. And all these guys here standing against you, they never killed anybody. 
we're better people than you. I mean, we just are. And, and you know, it's good that you, you think that God's using you, but what could He really do with a murderer? And, I mean, you know, it, it, it's cool. It's cool. I mean, we appreciate you. And, yeah, you know, it's, it's been nice. It's been nice. It just hasn't been that nice. And now we're ready to kind of, you know, take this and make it really what it should be. Because there's no way that God could use somebody like you. And, you know, while it's, it's true, there's a price to pay for sin. And there is. Um, it's, it's not your job to re remind Moses every chance you get that he's a sinner. Amen. Amen. Let, let, let God deal with him. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and this is an is issue, and I don't want to kick a dead horse because I will do that. I will do that, and I will leave it there. But uh, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up like a lot of you. And... Uh, I shouldn't be here. Amen. And, uh, and uh, you know, I've, I've, had, I've had gang members look me in my face and tell me I should be dead. And that they had a hit on me in high school. And um, I, I just kind of, I, la I laughed it off because that's how, that's Brother Randy. You know, I laugh it off. Uh, oh, yeah, I must not, not have been for too much, huh? And, and you know, he, he just kind of brushed it off. And I walked out in the parking lot. And God smote my heart. And he said, I saved your life twice. I saved your soul, and I saved your filthy, wicked hide. And, and so, I mean, there are probably people watching this. They, they know where I came from, too. And uh, I don't deserve to be up here. I don't take it lightly. And... Um, but uh, hopefully you're not here to hear from me, amen? You're here to hear from God. So let's just continue, shall we? But um, I, I just want to say to those who are always first to remind Moses he's a murderer, and I know they're in here, and those of you who will not let a man lead you because you know what's in his past, you know what kind of sins he has, and you say, oh, well, I'm not a murderer like him, you know, I would uh, beckon you to read 1 John 3.15, which says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. Yeah. Amen. Oh, well, that's just, that's just figurative. <laughs> what does it mean? Didn't it say it? Whosoever hateth his brother... Oh, well, you're in the wrong dispensation. You need to stink and put that in your pipe and smoke it, buddy. You don't believe the Bible or something? And you may laugh, but I venture to say that someone's laughing in here that has that hatred for their brother. Don't, don't miss the point here. Don't miss the point here. See, as everything's spinning out of control, we don't need any satanic Christians. Amen. <laughs> so if you didn't guess what the next point was, it's rebellions. Let's go to number 16 and verse 12. And I, I can't read. It's the whole chapter, so I just got to move. If you, you read the whole chapter when you get home or even after the service, but I got to move. But um, so what we see in verse 12 is Moses sent to call Dathan, Abiram, the sons of Eliab, uh, which said, we will not come up. And I just want to point up right there in, in verse 12 that they're unreasonable. It's people unreasonable. And rebellious people have a few tendencies that are hard to shake. Why? Because they have a heart problem. Right. And coming to church, you know, for a year, it probably isn't going to fix your heart. But you're, you got a bad heart problem. Yeah. Like, this is going to take years. Preach. You need to sit under preaching. Yeah. You know, and I thank God our churches don't offer counseling. Come on. Come on. You know, I, you know I, I heard um, it was Buddy Cargo. He's one of my favorite preachers. I never got to meet him. But... I can listen to his blowout uh, sermons over and over. I really, uh, I want to meet that guy in heaven. But, but um, he said, uh, you know, he had some guy calling him up saying, hey, do you offer counseling? He said, sure I do. He said, I offer it at 
uh, uh, what's the traditional service like? 10 a.m., 11 a.m. on Sunday, and then 7 p.m. on Wednesday, three times a week. And they're oh no, we're talking more like one on one. He's like, that is my counseling. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of uh, trouble pastors get into with counseling, and uh, they might do well to just do what God told them to do and preach. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Leave it like that. Yeah. But I want to point out that these folks are unreasonable. They say, we will not come up. Why not? You were standing up. You are all big just a moment ago. Why don't you come up in front of everybody? Oh, no, we're not going to come up. Um, you know what? Uh, in Romans 1.30, it talks about these folks that... Um, have been turned over to a reprobate mind. And as you read the, the chapter, you find characteristics that are just, man, define our day. Wow. But let's just look at a couple verses. It just says, Romans 1.30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Okay, well, let's move on. Without understanding covenant breakers, without natural affection, and then there's a weird, archaic, old word that should have been corrected. Implacable. Implacable? Who says that anymore? Implacable. That's a word right there. That means not able to be appeased. That is the type of unreasonable Christians we're working with today. And they are unable to be appeased. Um, they may say, uh, I'm like, how old am I again? Yeah. <laughs> Until you're 33, you're not a man. Until you're 33, you're not a man. That's been said to my face. Well, it was a while ago. <laughs> I love you, brother. <laughs> Let me get him a mic real quick. <laughs> we'll just have Brother Hilton. I still want him to finish his message from a couple blowouts ago, but, but um. Then you turn 33, and they're still mad at you. And, oh, Randy's not called to preach. I don't steal anybody from your church. I get all new people, and they're still mad at me. And, uh, oh, well, Randy's a, Randy's a rebel. Okay, Randy's a rebel. Okay. Um, now, I don't know if you guys know me, and probably a lot of you don't, but I know a lot of you. You know, I want to know everybody here, but um, when, when, I, when Pastor Yancey raised me up in the ministry, I didn't want to be a pastor. Now, I thought I was full-blown called to be an evangelist. Me and my wife sold our house, moved into a fifth-wheel trailer. We got a, a truck to pull it, and man, I, I, was, uh, I was ready to go, and I had prayed. I had asked folks to pray for us. It seemed like everything was there. Uh, we sold a mobile home and made money. Like, my mom is a realtor, and she's like, that doesn't happen, Randy. You never make money selling a mobile home. <laughs> but we, we made money, and I'm just sitting there like, oh, God's all over this. God's all over this. And then the deacons chase out my pastor, and I will say that to their face, okay? So I'm not saying nothing I haven't said to their face, okay? They chased my pastor out, and here I am. I'm sitting, having a preach to a congregation that hates me because my pastor's gone, and I was the only preacher there. And, and a, a deacon should be able to preach. Am I right about that? So if, if you have a deacon who can't preach, why is he a deacon? That's, that's called deep exegesis right there. But they can't preach. 
they chased my pastor off, and here I am. I am like, I'm in the driveway with the engine running, ready to go on the road, ready to go. I don't even know where I'm ready to go. I, where am I going? And, and, and slowly, this thing starts to just fall apart. And I'm meeting in a living room with one other family that wasn't going to stick around for what they were doing. And I'm like, well, we got to pray for a pastor. And I'm preaching. Their, their son uh, is preaching. Uh, he was doing Sunday school for me. And it must have been about probably a month, maybe two months. And they came to me and said, Randy, we have been praying and we think you should be the pastor. And I was like, well, that, that's nice. But I'm, I'm an evangelist. I'm called to be an evangelist. And I went home that night, and I feel like God kind of put me in the corner. And it's like, are you following your dreams, or are you following me? Oh, but God, I'm going to lose my reputation. Like I said, are, are you following your dreams, or are you following me? But everyone's going to hate me. Are you following your dreams, or are you following me? So... Um, I said, well, you know, I, I got to give the classroom answer. <laughs> of course, I'm following you, God. Yeah. And then I sat back and like, I'm following you, God. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't hear God audibly, but it was a heavy impression when I heard or felt all that. Are you following me or are you following yeah. your dreams? And... I said, well, God, I'm following you. And yeah. slowly I got the opportunities Amen. to put my money where my mouth was. And here I am, January next year, um, which is next month, um, we're going to celebrate our nine-year anniversary Amen. of A.V. King James Baptist Amen. Church. Amen. And, uh, I mean, the Lord. I, know I could talk a lot about that. But anyway... Uh, I guess in some aspects, it's kind of like what you were saying. You thought it might be one thing, and God kind of switched it. And, and God confirmed my call into me. Uh, I believe this right here is a conf confirmation of my calling. You know, and uh, if, if I would have just uh, ran out of town and done what I thought I was about to do, I don't think this would have ever happened. But I knuckled down. And I said, all right, God, I don't know how to be a pastor at all. I mean, the only real pastor I ever had was Pastor Yancey, and he's gone. Um, I will, uh, I'll just try to do my best. And he came with me, so I just thank God for that. Um, but nevertheless, um, and I'm just sharing a little bit of my testimony because maybe it fits someone else's in here. I, I'm just guessing, but... When you're dealing with unreasonable, irrational folks, you can't reason with the unreasonable. And, and at some point in your life, no matter male, female, preacher, or non-preacher, whatever, you're, you're a Christian, you want to serve God, at some point in your life, you're going to have to focus on just pleasing God. Amen. And it's times like that, you know, that, that you're going to hold on to... Uh, when a man's ways please the Lord, it will make even his enemies to be at peace with him. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And that's all you got to hold on, because no one's happy with you. And you're like, you know, I, I, can't, I can't please uh, th these folks that I love, that I went to church with for years. I can't please them. You know, they, want, they, they don't want me anymore. You know, I can't please the old punk rock scene. They won't have me back. I can't please my old drug addict buddies. They don't want me back. You know, and I can't, can't even please my old uh, Christian rock friends. They don't want me back. You know, and uh, you know, I can't even please you guys. But I can try to please God. Amen. And, and if anybody else wants to come with me, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Good. Good, and, uh, but re rebellious people um, have irrational expectations. Acts 15.10, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? That was a sobering moment for some Jews. And they said, you know what, guys? Let's just, let's just be honest here. You don't wake up in a three-piece suit. <laughs> Amen? Let's just, 
let's just be honest here, you know. Um, That's true. You lose your keys and, and you lose your cool, don't you? You probably said some things to your wife, you know, that you wouldn't say behind a pulpit. Hey, man. Some of you would say it behind a pulpit, but <laughs> I'm not saying that to your credit. <laughs> But rebellious people are looking to ju justify their exodus from the church. So when they're sitting in their living room with their sinful self, they'll raise their fist to God and, and they're going to say this statement, there's not a church close enough to me. And God's going to say, well, you didn't like the one I gave you. Uh, then they're going to say, but there are no Christians for me to fellowship. And God's going to say, you hated the ones I sent you. And then they're going to reply, but they compromise so much. And God's going to say, so do you. And uh, there was a statement here, and, and I'm not negating it. I think it's factual, but it's also factual in this aspect. As you get older, your convictions get softer. But, you know, as you get older as well, you, you get more merciful. That, that's why a lot of older people will become conservative. I know I'm not a Republican, just so you know. I'm not a Democrat either. You know, uh, I, I told my brother-in-law, I'm a, I'm a Baptist. We're worse. <laughs> We're worse, okay? <laughs> but you get more merciful. Why? Because you get a more realistic view of yourself sure. and your shortcomings. Yeah, right. And uh, uh, somebody in here needs that. Yeah. Amen? But after this re re rebellions, the third thing we come to in Numbers 16 is a rising up in verse 23. It says, I believe, oh, I'm sorry. I believe a good pastor is not always looking for somebody to rebuke, right? They're not. A good pastor, like, you know, I don't get my, my, uh, my kicks going around correcting people. I don't get my kicks doing that. I, I, want, I want to enjoy my time here just like anybody else. You know, and at church, uh, I need that fellowship as much as my people need it. You know, but uh, when a pastor is trying to keep those sheep uh, safe in enjoyable pastors where there's no threat, uh, that's why when there's a threat approaching, a good pastor is not going to react too early. Why? Well, because most of us had done that and we like, yeah, why aren't doing that again? You know? <laughs> You, you come up and you say something too early, you shouldn't have said it. It was just going to work itself out. Yeah. Normally, it'll just work itself out. Uh -huh. But you watch as a shepherd. And, uh, and we, I mean, uh, I, I don't attribute anything in my walk to anything up here. I blew all that out years ago. But I feel like God gives me insight. Yeah. And, uh, and it's, it is, it's weird. How I could just sit there sometimes and I'll tell my wife, they're not, they're not going to be around long. And, and she's like, what do you mean? You know, they're nice, so we're enjoying our time. Yeah, yeah but yeah. They're, they're not going to be here long. Yeah. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, sometimes I've been right. Yeah. But I just watch and I wait. And uh, a good pastor will defend the sheep. Amen? Amen. Amen. And you think about in the, in, in the picture of a, a, a shepherd with his sheep, you know, he's not, he's not going to wait to throw a rock at that wolf while he's two miles away. He's just going to look. He's going to notice. And he's going to be like, all right, get that little satchel a little bit closer, you know? Is satchel a word? <laughs> it's a word Sean would say. That's why I looked at him. But... <laughs> But, you know, you get that thing close to you and you get ready, don't you? Well, you don't want to throw out your arm throwing two miles down the road. You're going to wait till that thing is close enough where it's not even going to be a question. You tried to bite one of my sheep. And I'm going to blow the rear end off of that uh, coyote or whatever. Wasn't it a coyote or what was it? As a wolf, yeah. Oh no, in your story though, it was a hawk. It was a hawk, I'm sorry. I'm going to blow the rear end off that thing. <laughs> you know, and there's not going to be any question, you know. And uh, we're going to take the bits and pieces and we could, we could hook it up later. Um, but but, but when, 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 the, when the pastor, when the pastor cinches down, it's a death blow. And, and it's not to hurt people, it's to protect the sheep. 
And I think I lost all you guys. So I, I don't know. I didn't, didn't mean to do that. Um, I'm not eloquent in my speech. I apologize. Um, here, turn to your Bible. Let's get spiritual again. Go to 2 Timothy 4. Bunch of sinners. Now, a lot of the preachers have been going to this text, so I don't know what that's all about, but uh, you might want to think about that. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. And then these three phrases, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, if, if things like this persist and you have a good pastor, there's going to come a day that he'll need to face this thing and deal with it. Right? And uh, that's exactly what Moses had to do when it came to this situation in Numbers 16. So let me show you how he does it. There's a rise in reproof in Numbers 16, 23, and specifically uh, 24. It says, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Oh, well, did you have to name their names? Don't you think that was kind of mean, Mo? <laughs> and it says, in, uh, or let's look at then at, at re reprove. Reprove means to blame, to charge, to convince of a fault. Um, the, the Bible says in Proverbs 9, 8, 9, 8 and 9, it says, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. And then in verse 9, it says, Give instruction to a wise man, he'll be yet wiser. You know, um, a, lot, a lot of your experience, and I'm, I'm not using that in a Pentecostal way, but in, in, a, in a lot of your experience in church and what you're going to get out of church is going to be gauged on that right there. Um, when, the, when the pastor sends over a, a reproof from over the pulpit and you don't receive it, um, that is going to quench uh, the Holy Spirit in the place. And it's also going to cinch something up in your life. And, and a lot of it might be because of like what we talked about, the over-familiarity. You just know them too well. You know, they don't really care of themselves like a pastor. They don't look like a pastor. You know, and you know, they joke too much. And I, I know I probably do joke too much. Uh, but hey, man, we all got something to work on. What do you got to work on? You got something? Raise your hand if you got something. Amen. Okay. All right. I'm in good company. All right. But uh, if, if things like this persist, your, your pastor has to face it. And in Romans 16, 17, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. And, and I think any preacher, when, when well, maybe not any preacher. This is just how my mind works. But... I think uh, I like to refer of a good old-fashioned shunning. That is so old school, man. And it's just not practiced anymore at all. But it's to help them. It's to help them. And, and that's part of the recipe that you don't understand. And, and if you leave that part out of the recipe, you're not going to get the final product. And, and you're, you're, oh, you know... Did you have to name him Moses? Like, that wasn't very kind. And Moses is like, no, they need to get right. Of course I had to name him. Well, that's just not very classy. Well, is it classy or is it biblical? I don't know. Which would you rather be, classy or biblical? You know? Uh, one, you'll have people to be your friends, and one, God will be your friend. Um. So let's go to one of the most avoided Bible verses in the Baptist church. Matthew 18. Verse 15. Give me an amen when you're there, just so I know you're with me. Amen. Okay. I got kicked. It's your turn, all right? <laughs> Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Amen. 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 
Do you understand that little thing would keep so many churches together? That little thing is such a big thing. And it takes some guts, for lack of what I would normally say. It takes some of those, you know, but if this thing would be exercised. Now, let's go back to the verse that I just, just read before that. It's uh, Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Amen. Amen. This is, doc- is Bible doctrine. Amen. And I, somebody out there is like, oh, that's not a Pauline epistle. Shove it up your nose, buddy. <laughs> Where did Paul unfold that thing and say, don't tell people that hurt you that they hurt you? Where did Paul say that? <laughs> then it stands. Yeah. Right? Good you, it's good to read the whole Bible. Amen. 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 we got King James Bible believers that only want to read the Pauline epistles. That's not a Bible believer. That's a Pauline epistle believer. Amen. Read your Bible. Bible Amen. means book. Amen? Like, Amen. Amen. Front to back. Front to back is a good way to read a book. <laughs> I know you guys are getting some deep nuggets, but they're chicken nuggets. All right? <laughs> but then there came a rising rebuke in Numbers 16. Uh, look at verse 26. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of of theirs, lest they be consumed with all their sins. Now, we already talked about it. They rebuked them by name. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15, And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not... Now, listen to this too, Baptist. Count him not as an enemy. But admonish him as a brother. Amen. Yeah. My, my dad, my, my, I love my dad. He was supposed to be here. He wasn't able to make it. But um, he always says, bitter or better? Yeah. Are you getting bitter or are you getting better? We, it's, you need to be getting better. So after the rising rebuke, we see the rising exhortation in number 16 and specifically in verse 26. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. Remember his name, Colin. That wasn't nice. You didn't have to say that. Like, how about, come on, guys, let's just go over here and leave those fellows there. No, he's like, get away from these wicked fools. That's not nice. And it says, but specifically, the exhortation is touch nothing of theirs lest they be consumed, um, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. That's the exhortation. Hey, and while you're leaving those wicked fools, leave everything of their wickedness. Amen? Amen. It's not nice. But then, uh, then we come up to the recall. And it's number 16, and i got to read this portion here. Verse 31, And it came to pass, as he made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder uh, that was under them. And the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that appeared to them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them. And they perished uh, from among the congregation. And all Israel that were round about them fled uh, at the cry of them. For they said, Let the earth swallow us up, lest the earth swallow us up also. And there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense. Um, I want to just say this. And uh, is little brother Joseph around? Come on up, brother. I told him it's not a surprise. He's ready. All right. Um, I want you just to stand right there and make sure you're looking at everybody. Get a good look at them. All right. Get a good look at them. Like, like, like if, if the FBI had to say who was in there. No. <laughs> but 
I, I want to point out here in verse 27, it says, So they get up from the tabernacle of Korah and Dathan and Abiram on every side, and Dathan and Abiram uh, came out and stood in the door of their tents, and their wives and their sons and their little children. Now, I want to, I want to just say, you, you, their kids were affected because of their decisions they made for God. Their children, you see? Like who cares about those fools? What about their kids? Because they all got recalled, didn't they? They all went down. So there was a recalling even of the youth. And your decision... Maybe you don't have kids here, and great. I mean, that's okay. Maybe you just come here, and you know, and this is fun, and that's good. But you know, when you come here, there's kids here that are watching you. Wow. And, and and your decisions, your speech, the topics, uh, the 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 fried pastor after the service, it is affecting children. Okay. But that's not all. That's not all. What about uh, in verse 37, it says, Speak unto Eliezer, the son of Aaron. Don't finish the sentence because I'm making a little application. We'll get there in a second. But it says the son of Aaron. He was his son. Amen? That's his son. What about what the youth recall? So after they all go down, he calls someone's son up. How how is that kid going to remember you when you leave the blowout? How is that kid going to remember you in five years? Keep looking at him, Joseph. Big eyes. Is, any, is anybody under 10 in here? Raise your hand if you're under 10. Anybody under 10? Could I get him to run up here too? Run up here. Can you you guys link your arms? Like, yeah, there you go. Just exactly. (laughs) Amen. What are these youth? What are these youth gonna recall? You know why I did this? You know why I did this? Because you guys are a visual people. That's why I did this. You're not gonna remember my message. You're gonna remember those eyes. You're gonna think about: Am I gonna show up next blowout to see these kids? They're gonna be wondering where you are. Are you gonna you gonna hang in there another year? Another two years, five years, wow. ten years, should the Lord tarry? I hope he doesn't, but you get my point? You're messing with these kids. I don't know what you're doing. It's going to hurt them. Matthew 18.6 But whoso shall offend... What? But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Don't do it. You don't got to listen to me. Hey, I'm nobody. Amen. There's better preachers here. Amen. They had more to say than me. You don't got to listen. Think about them. What you do behind closed doors is affecting these little guys. These guys want to serve God. And you you better not put a stone in their place. Thank you, guys. Thank you. But we're back in Numbers 16 and verse 39. And it says, And Eliezer the priest took the brazen censers, were with they that were burnt had offered. You know, uh, when people leave the church that you served with, that you sang with, you worship the Lord with, you serve, there's a pastoral recall. And you remember the people that left. I don't ever want anybody to leave my church. And it's not my church. I'm sorry, Lord. It's your church. But he put me there as an under-shepherd. He put me there. And I'm not trying to run people off. I want them all to stay. 
But when you sit there and you serve with people, and they get something in their craw, and they just can't get it out. They can't come to you and just say, look, man, you said this, you did this, whatever it was. Like, like what I said, there's a lot of people leaving for a lot of reasons. Yes. But a lot of them, and most of them, are not biblical reasons. In Matthew 18, would iron out a whole lot of that junk if you just man up. And I'm not taking the responsibility off me either, or any pastor. we got to be willing to do it too. Amen. And that's why I always get in trouble. You got to face it. And I mean, hey man, <laughs> after the first and ad second admonition, uh, whatever they got to do, you know, <laughs> try. Try. But there's a pastoral recall. And you may have minimal disagreements with your pastor on how the flowers are placed, but it's is it worth destroying a whole ministry? You know, I've walked into Pastor Yancey's little side room next to his piano. That's the church me and my wife got married in. That, and I don't really want to get started. But there's a side room, and it was piled with plastic flowers. Like, just a big trash can, man. And on a church cleanup day, me and my wife were like, Pastor Yancey, um, we want to clean that room for you. I thought I was doing something good. Man, there was people mad at me that oh, yeah. to this day have not forgiven me for getting rid of plastic flowers. Yep. Is it worth destroying a whole ministry over? You know, you may not know how close you are to pushing your pastor out of the ministry. I'm just telling you. You don't, you don't think about it. You don't, you don't think about it. How he can't sleep at night, praying over your wicked fool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on. Come on. You know, and we're not doing this to hurt you. I got better things to do with my time. You know what I'm saying? I'm doing this. I feel like God said, "Hey, man, you can help people doing this." I try to help people, yeah. but you know, I mean, if someone has cancer, you you better tell them. Yeah. You got a problem, bro? We need to start working on this. You know, you may not know how close you are to pushing your pastor out of the ministry. You know, possibly hurting hundreds or even thousands of people. You know, is your pet peeve really worth that? Your little pet peeve? I just, I just don't like that. No, oh, it's, it's just, it's that crutch word that he uses. Oh, so I can't even listen to him. <laughs> how he says, um, 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 like... <laughs> What's it worth, man? You get up there and you try. Tell, tell your pastor you want to try. You know, and then you get up there and, and all right, brother, you got 35 minutes. Go and you. Okay, sit down. Let me show you how it's done. Okay. But then, lastly, and we'll end here if you believe that, um, there's a shameful recall. In verse 40, and it says to be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger, which is not of the seed of Aaron, come near to offer incense before the Lord, uh, that he be not as Korah and his company, and as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. You know, and a, a lot of folks, I think you've been, you got, a lot of these guys have been in the ministry much longer than me. And I praise the Lord for them and I watch them and I just want to glean whatever I can. Um, but how are you going to be remembered? Are you going to be remembered as a help or a hurt? Oh, that's good. How are you going to be remembered? That's good, and you know what? You, you may, maybe in the past couple years, it's been rough, right? And you're not exactly up to par, but it, your story doesn't have to end there. Right. Amen? Amen. You know, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We, we need that. And His mercies are renewed every morning. Why? Because you need them renewed every morning. You. Don't look next to you. It's you. You need them renewed. Baptists have a hard time swallowing that. 
You need them renewed. But how are you going to be remembered? Are you going to stick with it? You know, maybe, like I said, maybe this message, I I didn't even touch you. Did those eyes touch you? Forget about me. Think about them. Forget about me. Think about your pastor. Just forget about me. You know, our, our church, um, I, I want to puff them real quick. I want to puff them up, man. Because uh, our church, <laughs> we're, we're in a dry desert wilderness, man, out, out there in more ways than one. And, um, and our folks are just willing to meet wherever we're going to meet. Amen. And we, we, got, we got kicked out of the, our place when COVID hit, and we had to meet in a park for six months, man. I'm preaching to softball moms and dads, you know. Hey, it was cool. Actually. That was kind of cool. You know, you get those dads that, you know, they they liked it. Of course, they're missing church to be a softball, but hey, man, church came to them that day. Amen. They didn't have to do that. They didn't have to do that. They liked it. You know, and we had some interesting stuff. We had a guy coming up with his boom box. I'm like, do they even have those anymore? And he came up with his boom box. And as I was preaching, he's like turning it up. So I just started street preaching. And I'm like, you're not going to go louder than me, buddy. And so he realized I wasn't quitting. And then he turned it down. And I just kept preaching to my folks, you know. But it's like, hey, man, you know, we, that stuff's fun. You know, and uh, he probably went home thinking, well, that's a crazy guy, man. I tried to drown him out. He didn't even look at me. He just kept going, you know. Yeah, praise the Lord. But you need to think not how you've started the race. You, you need to think not how you, I mean, it's, it's always good to remember, but it's not about how you start. It's not a 50-yard dash, okay? You need to pace yourself in this thing. You need to think about every step. Every little step matters. Open your Bibles and we'll finish here to Ecclesiastes 7.8. Ecclesiastes 7.8. If you go to Psalms in the middle of your Bible, hang a right. Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 8. And tell me, give me an amen when you're there and we'll just close right here. I still hear pages. <laughs> Which is good in a lot of churches that you don't hear pages anymore. You, it's good. You, you got a Bible. We're happy. Amen. Amen. It says this. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. I think those are connected right there. These, these folks had, had a pride problem. They weren't thinking about how they were going to end. You know how they ended. The world sucked them in. And that's what the world wants to do to you. I could go another 40 minutes, but uh, Pastor Gene, let's go ahead and let, let you have this.